This is the state of the front end. Um, I'm David Wong. I'm at Eatings, and this is Brian Wald. Hello. Uh, at Brian Wald. One of us has a much more easy to remember uh, handle. I'll let you figure out which one that is. Um, and we are uh, we work for Acquia, um, as is evidenced by the shirts, and we are both front end developers uh, by training, if not by our everyday to day experiences. And we'll go in a little bit about that later. Uh, just as a show of hands, who here saw us talk at Austin? Who, who, who saw my brain is full? Okay, great. So this recap One section person. is totally useful. We didn't know <laughs> if, uh, if we were going to go over old things. Um, we, we have three sections to our talk today. We have yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And uh, we'll, we'll talk first about yesterday. Um, and some of this is going to recap uh, what we talked about in our previous talk, uh, but it, it, it'll be good to follow along. So last time on My Brain is Full, uh, which was the, the talk that Brian and I gave, uh, we talked about how front end has changed a lot. I don't think anybody here can deny that of all the facets of practice that we discuss about at DrupalCon, front end is the, one that's, is the one that's undergone the most amount of changes in the shortest amount of time, uh, Drupal 8 changes notwithstanding. And actually, even taking into account Drupal 8, front end has probably changed more than any other practice uh, within the, the, the Drupal aegis. Uh, in that time, Drupal itself hasn't changed very much. Front end has changed. You know, uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit here. Uh, but the front end developer experience, say, starting from 2006 or 2007 or so to the front end experience of 2014, is a dramatically different enterprise. Whereas Drupal is still pretty much Drupal. You know, you're entering things into forms. You're, you know, hook altering things and, and that sort of thing. And more importantly than that. As front end has changed, and Drupal hasn't, we haven't been very good at predicting things. You know, we, we've laid our bets pretty heavily in some places, and those bets have paid off in, say, like jQuery. And then we've also had really long bike sheds and discussions about things like, you know, BEM or OCSS or you know other things where we might not have fallen on the right side of history. And, and it's not even so much about predicting as it is, um, you know, when Drupal seven was released, for instance, we had a very set way of doing things. And so things were kind of baked into the CMS in that manner. So what we expected to see in Drupal 7 changed dramatically as, as we got throughout the life cycle of, of where we are in Drupal 7 now, which is you know at the horizon of Drupal 8 being released. So uh, this is a slide we used in our last, last session. Um, and essentially what we're talking about here is um, you can't see the very bottom. Oh, you can. Uh, is, is some dates there. And, and, and what this is talking about is the life cycle of um, Drupal versus the life cycle of front-end technologies. So, um, you, you know, when we, when we first launched Drupal 7, Blueprint uh, grid system, 960 grid system, things like uh, Kufan, which is, you know, managing your fonts and so forth, uh, we're, we're kind of the normal. And then as, as we progressed throughout the time, you know, that changed. But Drupal is still exactly the same. So if you look at uh, that first part of that, as I was talking about, those are, those are what we expected when we started Drupal 7. And then we go to the next part, and this is not what we expected when we started with Drupal 7. So we have a lot of um, conflicting, conflicting pieces of information coming to this. So we, we, we have to kind of retrofit what we're using on the front end to move it into Drupal so that we can do the things that people are expecting in 2014 from their websites to perform. The gist of this being that Front end's moving way faster than Drupal, right? I don't think anybody here it would say, wow, Drupal core development happens at such a clip, I can't keep up. Well, maybe you can reasonably say that in the last month or so, but you can't historically. You know, Drupal is, is geologic time compared to the, the speed at which front end technologies have moved. Um, and th this is not even counting things like just responsive, but even things like, you know, today's JavaScript framework is yesterday's laughable pile of spaghetti. You know, like there, there are things on the front end space that move so much faster that, that iterate and operate and, and come into and fall out of fashion faster than uh, Drupal itself can ever keep up with. And this includes things like contributed modules as well. And lastly, the one thing that we covered uh, that was really important, and I think everybody here would agree, is front end is a thing. Like a thing thing, right? Front end isn't, uh, 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 front end is its own practice. It, front end is a discrete skill set. Front end isn't the place where you just shove your junior developers and then say, get better at this and then you'll write modules one day. You know, front end is a distinct practice with its own skill set, tools, and best practices that are robust and as solid as any other facet of Drupal development. And this is what can't be undersold. This is one of those things where, you know, 
front-end developers and Drupal, you know, the alliance has been not very, you know, very easy at times, and, and equal footing is definitely a thing. And ultimately, it, the reality is, is that when it comes to the requirements of the web and the kind of technology that's driving Drupal technology forward, it's the front end that's pushing it. It's not the back end. Front end is pushing Drupal forward, not the other way around. So today, not literally today, but you know, today, um, you know, after those benighted days that we just spoke of. Play it again, Frank. Okay, so Frank Camaro. Does anybody here know who Frank Camaro is? So Frank Camaro is a designer, uh, formerly of the New York Times and other August institutions, who is rather opinionated and uh, writes blog posts. And uh, we cited a blog post from our previous talk. Um, I actually asked for a response for him uh, uh, regarding that, and this is what he wrote. Quote, we need to do a better job of describing the connective tissue of making things for the web. Everyone is describing the one little piece they've created, but don't explain or even reference the larger concepts of how all of these elements link together. This is, in my mind, just a symptom of the web stack being so deep. The more interconnected and complex a system becomes, the more difficult it is to tease apart. You have to see the progress while it's happening to decipher it. So if you're like me and missed out on a couple years, you only see the tangle of Christmas lights. Frank Camaro uh, on Designer News uh, in July 2014. Uh, I, I have to preface this every time I quote Frank Camaro. Frank Camaro is under the age of 35, so he's not a, 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 an old timer. He's not somebody who's you know lost his way. He's somebody our age, doing the same things we're doing, you know, having the same struggles that we're describing. So welcome to the new normal, the post-responsive world. I, I wanted to put up an even more graphic and destroyed landscape, but I don't want to think responsive is a bad thing. It just sort of cleared the table and, and set new rules. And I think we're still picking up the pieces for you know, what it means to have our, 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 our sort of precious ideals, you know, pre-responsive, you know, be so utterly destroyed and, and reset. So the table stakes to the new front end game. Responsive, right, responsive. It's just, it, responsive is a thing now. You know, it, it's, responsive design isn't. Uh, it's expected. Uh, it's expected, you know, exactly. Yeah. These are all things that are expected now. They're touch. expected to, to do responsive, you're expected to manage devices that have touch. It needs to be performant, and that doesn't just mean, you know, you're, you're compiling your CSS code. This means that you're running, you know, tests and console, you know, uh, evaluations of how your scripts are running. You're, um, you know, taking into consideration how the JavaScript libraries work together. All of these things, you know, you're doing a lot more engineering than what was uh, um, a part of, you know, the yesterday of a front end. Um, as, as I just said, JavaScript is cool again. So it's, you know, this concept of everything has a framework. Everything um, runs uh, uh, based off of, uh, you know, everything's running in the DOM now. We're not doing everything from the server side. We can do a lot of things just straight with the JavaScript injected into the site, which is another reason what's not playing super well with Drupal, because that's not how it was built to be made. So um, go ahead. Multiple frameworks for everything. Uh, I, I think it's everybody here has played with at least one framework in the Drupal. I don't, does anybody here make a Drupal site without a single framework, CSS, JavaScript, or otherwise on it? Okay, there we go. That, for, for the video audience next week, that was zero people. Um, everybody uses a CSS framework of some kind, multiple CSS frameworks. People use multiple JavaScript frameworks if necessary. You have CSS frameworks on top of CSS frameworks. You have you know, their own individual theming, you know, for if you use something like Bootstrap. There's multiple pieces that have to be assembled. Uh, this gives us lots of powerful new toys. We have a lot of power at our disposal now, more power than we ever had before uh, with, with all the capabilities that we have. But uh, there's two sides to this. So good news, everybody. As a front end, <clears throat> as a designer and a front ender, you have almost no limits. So for example, this is hugeinc.com. I'm not, this is not, we're not getting paid by them. They just had a very trendy site. <laughs> Scroll jacking, flat colors, uh, you know, this, uh, this crazy tiling thing that's going on. They have embedded media. Um, you know, they have a hamburger menu. I mean, who, who doesn't love the hamburger menu? You know, this is everything 2014 design embodies, right? Flat colors, boom. And so the bad news is that designer and front end have no, almost no limits. The exact same problem, for example, Let's take a look at this Microsoft site. Same idea, but this is what I would consider design for design's sake. You know, if I were to interview these developers, they'd probably say, well, that's because I could. 
and uh, not because you know we're using these tools in the right way. So there's two sides to the coin, and that's and that's that's part of the the, the, the piece of you know where we come in as uh, conductors and, and orchestrating these things. So as designers, now we design and design dynamically along so many more facets than before. It's not simply opening up Photoshop anymore and drawing something. You have interaction design, you have to consider it. personalization design, application design, multi-device design. It's so many more axes than were previously considered normal. So for developers, there's been an explosion of tools to help us meet this. And, and so you know, we, we, they recognize that, and it, and it catches up to us. It's this idea that you know, we're, always, we're always chasing something here. Um, so for example, some of this is the automation, testing, um, performance, uh, leveraging new features, managing the browser in context, writing less code, DRY, which is you're probably all familiar with, um, do not repeat yourself. Uh, keeping up to the pace with the checks and, and, and modularity so that you can swap things in and out. Um, you know, using front ends that are not Drupal facing, not using the template system, you know, quote unquote, headless Drupal, for instance, and um, uh, building repeatable units for functional functionality. So, spoiler alert. Lucky for you, there are sessions on all of these topics. Um, let's, let's kick it back a little more. So, all of these on testing, on automation, on performance, on new features for browsers and uh, in languages, uh, managing your browser's context, and, and things like uh, writing less code, keeping your pieces in check. I think there's two sessions on layouts, uh, non Drupal front ends. There's, I think, three sessions on non Drupal <laughs> front ends. Uh, and then uh, John Albin here in the front row is talking about things like web components uh, that is packaging up functionality in a, in a more meta way than, than we've ever done before. We ha there are sessions on the front end track, and also a little beyond the front end track as well, that everybody should go see, because these are the new normal for uh, a Drupal developer, and you should be up to date on these things, uh, because we say so. Uh, no. So as the expectations and capabilities have grown for your website, your web app, uh, so have the tools and practices emerged to meet them. So these things aren't coming out of the ether. These aren't things that have just magically sprung up for no good reason whatsoever. It's because people wanted to do something new. They wanted to be able to fill in functionality they didn't have before. They wanted to, 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 be, to have tools to make these things easier. The, the goal of these techniques and these practices is to make your life easier, to make it possible, not to make your life harder, even though they might do that uh, as a side effect. Note, though, many, if not all, of these practices are outside of Drupal. Your CSS frameworks, Drupal doesn't care. Your JavaScript frameworks, Drupal doesn't care. All of these things. The modern front-ender skill sets are mostly non-Drupal-centric. The things that you have to know as a front-ender concern themselves mostly outside of Drupal. And Drupal is sort of a secondary, if not tertiary, concern to you. Um, which is, I think, kind of ironic, given that we're giving the first talk in the front end at a DrupalCon, but it is, it is the reality that we face. So, yeah, and going off of that, you know, the complexities aren't always just about building. It's not always about, um, you know, having a hard time managing your grunt tasks or whatever it may be that you're doing for your website. These are also, you know, uh, uh, business concerns as well. Take, for example, you know, when you built the site in, in 2008, 2009, you could be very predictive. You could, you could make really, really educated guess on how long it's going to take you to build the front end of that. And that's not so much the case anymore. You know, a lot of times we're seeing budgets go way over, way over and beyond what you expected because there's just a lot of components that you just can't take into consideration. You know, when you're getting into a lot of different devices, um, way that things are interaction patterns that haven't been thought about when you get into an iPhone or a, 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 an Android device, for instance, and uh, become very complex. And, and, and the other side of that is that when you do actually scope something, you know, relatively accurate to what it takes to do in the front end now, you have another problem, and that's that clients say, well, I used to be able to build a website, you know, the front, the, the design piece of it, the front end piece of it only took, you know, 70 hours. Why is it taking 400 now? What's, what's, what's changed? I don't get that. And so they don't understand that how fast this has changed means that it's a lot, it's a lot more complex and there's a lot more that we have to manage. You can't just make a site mobile. So, so tomorrow, and not literally tomorrow, but the figurative tomorrow. So we came out of the 90s where you know, this, was your, this was web design. This is web development, right? Shove it into a table, make the table as complex as you need to, boom, it's done. A lot of people still do it this way. And 
this is what you were designing for. These are your targets. You had a clunky PC or a Mac. You had these two browsers, and you had these two viewports, maybe even just one of them to, con to concern yourself with. So now, this is more likely what you're dealing with when you're taking a look at a project now. These are all the things that you have to take into consideration. You have to consider, you know, 10 different devices, uh, five browsers at least, a ton of viewpoints, not only um, you know, when it's, it's, it's just looking at it, but also if they rotate it into portrait or landscape, uh, mobile views, what happens when somebody uses touch, how are all those things taking into consideration? Those are much bigger problems to be solving than we used to be solving with, in, in development of these websites. And unfortunately, that list is never going to grow shorter. It's never gonna grow shorter. It's only gonna get bigger. Like there is no unwinding the clock and going back to the 90s. So where does this take us? So the front end will always be chasing the next big thing. I mean, that's, that's, that's a, but you know, th this concept of us chasing things is not, is not something that is, is, is gonna go away and it's not something that's particularly new. You know, this is something that's been going on for a long time. For example, uh, uh, here, here's 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 a, a video that we just pulled from from the the keynote um, of the uh, the iWatch release, and this is just a short snippet of this, but uh, I'd like to play it for you. For if example, you if you take a gesture like oh, no, pinch to playing. zoom, <laughs> let's try that again over here. It covers the content. It obstructs. Oh, did you just okay? Well, it only plays if you okay. Play on the big one there. For example, if you take a gesture like pinch to zoom. It covers the content, it obstructs your view, it just doesn't work. And so, so we placed extra functionality in a mechanism that's been on the watch for decades. It's this dial, it's called the crown. And on the Apple Watch, it's called the digital crown. The digital crown includes infrared LEDs oh, and photos. This is where I'm supposed to stop. Okay. Um, so, um, the, 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 the idea here, hold on, let me get back to, um, having a little bit of a difficulty here. Doesn't want to switch. It's the other way. Darn you, Apple. <laughs> so right. who's ready to build some dial-based front ends? Right, this this idea that oh yeah we, we figured it out now oh you know phones we got it we've got phones down we've got tablets down oh great now we have to create for a watch and it's not just a smaller device it has this dial and this is an interface that we hadn't considered before and why why are you disturbing my my comfortably held mastery of responsive front end so and we are kind of you know th this is sort of a point that we're making that's a little ridiculous but it's not either because it, it's the reality. I mean, it is. new devices come out, new techniques come out, new design patterns come out, and you have to respond to that, and you have to be able to meet the needs of, the, of what work the expectations are. So it is very possible in one year from now you may be designing for an uh, interface on a watch. It's very possible. So, um, so here it is. So, so the, the goal, this is you know, what we wanted to talk with you guys about here today, and this goal is to be truly device-independent design and development. You know, for example, headless Drupal, that is such a popular trend right now. API-driven Drupal, which is the same idea, which is uh, essentially being able to normalize your content, normalize how things are displayed, and letting the device make the decisions on how that works. What's the best design pattern for that device? It doesn't always have to be, um, you know, starting with the, the mobile or starting with web and then, and then making it work on every other device. You know, that's that kind of technique. As you've seen, as, we've, as, as everything is getting more complex, as there's more devices, as there's more browsers, as there's more screen resolutions, is never going to work. And you're always, it's gonna be becoming more complex to manage. So this isn't something that just front-enders are working with. I mean, it's a problem for a lot of people. Um, and it's unfortunate that Jeff Eaton isn't here. Has anybody seen Jeff Eaton talk about the, about the battle of the body field or, or his content strategy talks? Uh, has, has anybody? Okay, um, has anybody seen the Karen McGrain talk from DrupalCon two years ago about content strategy? And so similar ideas exist outside the front end world and in the content strategy world as well. That the idea that we're writing, designing, publishing, and developing for a set number of contexts is a fool's errand. And that we're going to be, we can continuously chase that 
down that rabbit hole forever and never come out winners. You know, the, the idea that we can just you know, pick, oh, we'll just add today's device to the list of devices that we support and drop this other one off the list when it becomes deprecated is a fool's errand. Like, that's never going to be a winning strategy. That's always going to be just piling on more work for you building fragile sites that only kind of work or target specific devices. I mean, who remembers the days of ActiveX, right? You know, like, there, like that kind of idea, specifically targeting contexts and devices is not going to win. And in the end, uh, what we need is something that's much more ecumenical, something that's much more, that's much less device centric, that's much less context centric, that the content that you can display anywhere, the site that you can view on any device, the design that accommodates tons and tons of context, irrelevant of whether it's a privileged one or not. That's the goal. And granted, it's a bit of a, uh, you know, it's a bit of a unicorn, but, you know, it, there's nothing wrong in setting the sites high. And so this idea of chasing, this idea of um, always being one step behind it in, in technology is not a new one, and it's not a, something that's going to go anywhere either. For example, um, uh, I have a, a video here from a, a, a lecture in 1969 with the philosopher Alan Watts, who was talking to uh, the IBM engineers about uh, the problem of this exact problem. He's talking about the problem that technology is moving so fast that you'll never keep up. You'll never keep up with it. And so I'll just play you a quick piece of that. And this is when he's talking about um, managing catalogs, which is you know a little different context, but it's the same idea. Just gonna skip that. But it's exactly the same in almost any other field. There's an information explosion, like a population explosion. How on earth are you going to scan all that information? Yes, of course you can get computers to help you in this direction, but by Parkinson's law, uh, the sooner, uh, sooner you become more efficient in doing this, uh, the more the thing is going to develop so that you will have to have more efficient computers still to assimilate all the information. You'll be ahead, but <laughs> only for a short time. So, um, see if I can get back to my... Uh, what did you do last time to make this go? Just click on the outside. There you go. Yep. The, the so you see, there's this problem oh. of uh, the, the sort of... Alan Watts huh? haunting us from the grave. All right, I think I got it this time. All right. Maybe. All right. Yep. And then click on this back here. Yep. All right. No. What did you do? Does nothing. This is what we get for invoking yeah. old technology. Using a JavaScript library to uh, manage your <laughs> slideshow. Ambitious front-end developers reveal f will fail you. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the operative quote here, you'll be ahead, but only for a short time. And that's really kind of what front-end development is these days, right? You, you, you catch up, you catch up, you catch up, and you kind of get ahead, and you, you, you discover this library that fixes things for you, and like, bam, I've got this touch thing solved, solved, right? Or I, you know, I've, I've got this CSS library, boom, boom, I finally have this breakpoint thing nailed, right, or, or, or that. But it's only for a short time. None of that's permanent. You know, they're, they're called hacks for a reason. <laughs> I mean, the, the, these things, these tools that we build for ourselves to, to, to make Drupal do the things that we need it to do um, are, are, you know, shims. They're, they're little wedges that we shove into Drupal to make it work the way that we want it to work because it, well, is moving so slowly. Um, and to continue to, to develop a practice around that is it, it, foolish. And, and, and Brian and I have been talking about this a lot lately, and you can't build forever on top of hacks. Like, there, there has to be uh, a better way than this. Yeah. And so, um, you know, essentially here, what we wanted to get to at this point is, is we wanted to talk about, we wanted, we wanted to, since this is one of the beginning sessions of the front end track, we wanted to challenge you guys. We wanted to talk with you guys about, um, you know, stepping outside of your professional workday and, and thinking in terms of uh, what you're doing right now with CSS and SAS and your front end technologies and, and taking a step back and say, is this sustainable? And, and, and if not, if you agree with us that this is not sustainable, what are, what are some better ways of handling this? You know, what, why, you know, what we brought up last DrupalCon about headless Drupal and then that turned into such a big thing is, is because I think everyone, it's kind of on the tip of everyone's tongue that 
we can't keep going on this way, the way that we're developing right now. And we need to take a step back and think about how we can manage content, how we can have a CMS that manages content and delivers it on the front end in a seamless way that is sustainable and maintainable as well. So, um, I have jumped ahead a bit here. So <laughs> this is kind of our challenge. So we, we don't have pat answers, and as we get to go first, you know, <laughs> we're not expected to have pat answers. But we do have a challenge for you, and it's as much a challenge for ourselves as it is for everybody else who's attending this room. Design isn't how it looks, and the front end isn't just how it's styled. And those who have come to this session expecting to talk about designing things better or how to style things better, we have a greater challenge for you. And that's to learn something new this week that's beyond that. Think bigger than making things pretty. Think bigger than a new tool that you can add to your front end uh, toolbox. Think bigger, learn something, contribute your voice to the conversations here. The front end in Drupal 8 is extremely fluid right now. And there's a lot of contribution that is yet to be done. And there's a lot of voices that have not yet been heard. Um, and there's a lot of sessions that are going to be talking about the things that are available to you. Uh, and what we'd like for you, uh, for those of you who are interested and are still sticking around till Thursday, is to come back and reconvene uh, on Thursday at 2.15 p.m. Uh, and talk to us about what you've learned. And talk to us about what you've taken away from your sessions. And talk to about the things that have challenged you. And because we want to close the loop a little bit on this conversation. We don't just poke you and send and you out. And start to build the strategy. You know, that's, that's my goal is I want us to sit down and say, let's, let's think of a strategy as we move into Drupal 8. You know, we have a lot better templating system in Drupal 8 Twig, of course, but that's not the, that's not the end all be all. You know, managing our JavaScript library has become easier, all of those things. But uh, what I want to know is what, where are we going to go from there? You know, that's, that's how we manage the today. How are we going to manage the tomorrow when it becomes more complex and more things to manage? So I think... Um, at that point, we have a, a, a thank you slide, <laughs> and, uh, and, and our, and our handles as well, so you can. He's you know, Brian Wald. You can, I'm Brian Wald, and you can. Uh, I'm David Wong. Talk Brian. about that if you'd like. Um, we we, we a, were uh, told that we must be rated, um, and so this slide is uh, courtesy of DrupalCon Stephanie Amsterdam. So yeah, so I think at this point, I, it would you know we do have a fair amount of time. It would be good to talk to you guys, and if you have questions. Please let us know. I, I don't know if there's a mic for this room, but if anybody wants to, we'll take hands. There's whatever. probably a mic. Yeah, hands and or just open outcry. Really, no questions? Done. Wow, that was easy. All right, Lewis, yes, hi. So Lewis asked if there's any existing outside tools for front end. Do we see any, do we envision any of them coming into Drupal core or into contrib? Um, yeah, I see a lot of things going into contrib and core. Um, th there's already been, so those who haven't looked at Drupal 8 very recently, modernizer is in core, um, uh, backbone is in core, weirdly enough. There, there are a number Underscore. of projects that are already in core, but I don't know if adding things, more things into core is the way to go. Well, um, it, it, it also, uh, um, one of the better pieces I think about that is that we've removed things in, in the sense that we don't have the dependency of J uh, jQuery, for instance, on the front end anymore. Uh, you'll find that out if you start to load a theme and try to write some jQuery without loading the library, you, you won't be able to do that anymore. So. Um, I think that's actually the better direction is being a little bit more agnostic, but be, making it simple for people to add in what they need at that right time to do that. John. John asked, it, so we made the point in DrupalCon Austin that it's almost impossible to know everything there is to know about Drupal's front end systems, like to know the, the entire Just breadth front of everything available to us. Front, oh, front, front, in, front end yeah. practice, you know, abstract front end practice in general. 
I kind of feel that's still true. I, I think part of the problem is that you're not only expected to know all of front-end practice, you're also expected to know all the weirdness of Drupal as well. And that's like already two brains worth of things, right? You, got, you have to, to be a really, really proficient front-end developer. You have to know all this, I think we termed it Drupal bullshit like in, in our last talk. And, and it's kind of true. Like you have to know all these other things about Drupal that are in no way intuitive to any other system. And bespoke to Drupal itself, and you have to be an expert in Backbone, or you have to be an expert in jQuery, and you know, have to know this CSS system, you know, you know, soup to nuts. And I don't think that's a reasonable proposition to make. And I think Drupal 8 does make step strides in the right direction towards, uh, you know, making it less dependent on knowing that Drupaliness. But I'm not certain it goes far enough. You know, I, I, I it, you know, so in conversations with others, you know, one of the things that's always come up is like, why do front-end developers leave Drupal, right? And the, you know, front-end developers leave Drupal for a variety of reasons. For a lot of them is that wrestling with the Drupal beast becomes less fruitful than rolling your own Node app or you know, working with React.js or you know, whatever sexy front-end framework you like. And there's something to be said of that being our competition. You know, like as developers, that's really the competition that we are measuring Drupal against. Like what, how easy is it to build, you know, it's easy to build Drupal sites for these following reasons, but from the front end, how do we measure up against this alternative system, um, all other merits aside, you know, taken away? You know, say nothing about content modeling, to say nothing of, you know, like complex architectures. How easy is it to, quote unquote, theme a site in Angular versus Drupal? And I, I think for, uh, once you hit a certain proficiency level, um, it, the, the scales tip in the opposite direction against Drupal than, than, than with. Any more questions? Oh, over there. Two oh, hey, yeah. go ahead. What are, your, what are your favorite tools and frameworks? Oh, my favorite, we're Brian. <laughs> Me? F favorite tools and frameworks today? Um, in Drupal or just in general? Um, well, uh, I, I think that there's, I, I personally like to run everything on, on, on Node and, and, and run an Angular front end, but that's because I work on the Angular project, so I'm a little bit biased. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, some of the really cool things that excite me about where front end is going is actually some of the tools that are just managing these, all of these libraries and, and managing all of these tasks. For instance, Grunt, right? You know, running Grunt or Ant or, or one of those methods for um, compiling and doing a lot of the, you know, the, the heavy lifting for you so you're not constantly managing those things um, over and over again. You're able to, you know, run your lint, you're able to run um, compressions, you're able to, um, you know, d just manage a lot more and making, making your life a lot easier. So uh, when you get into situations where you're running an Angular app and then all of a sudden you, um, you know, some other developer comes in and wants to strip that out, you can make those kind of modular changes easily that way. Please. The question was, do you think that uh, web components and polyfills will decrease the complexity of the front end? Uh, John, who's sitting in the first row, is giving a talk on web components. Sorry, Preston. Session, Preston. Yeah. There's a, uh, Preston is doing a session on, on web components, and and John's doing one on design components. Um, Brian and I are a big fan of components, like in the lowercase c sense, breaking yeah. up manageable chunks of things, whether they be in a single language or multiple languages, um, that you can package and then reuse. Um, that's the overall trend of things in front end. Um, the you can argue its maturity in the Drupal space, but you know, the, the general, the wind is blowing in that direction. You know, uh, if we were... Um, yeah, as much yes as I can. I might look foolish a year from now, but you, we'll, we'll say yes for now, sure. And, and part of the talk is that, you know, a lot of people look like idiots now for saying, we should have put Blueprint in the, in the, you know, Drupal core, and, you know, how fun would that be, overriding Blueprint every Drupal site you make now? Well, you laugh, but that's the same thing that people are doing at Drupal 8 now, too. We that's need true. to add these things in here, and then in, in a year, that's not going to be relevant anymore. So that's why I'm a big fan of making yeah. it available to swap those things out as you need them, rather than forcing something down them. Any other questions? Oh, please. Yeah. Yeah. 
what, if we had to place bets on what might not be smart to have put into Drupal 8. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I mean, if you, if you are someone who was of the mindset that, uh, you know, headless Drupal and content API-driven Drupal, uh, I think that that would be anything <laughs> on the front end, right? Because if you, if you have a template system like Twig, right, which we are as much improved over the original with the, the, the PHP template uh, system that we're using right now, um, that system still isn't going to be sufficient for headless necessarily. I mean, it, will, it serves a better purpose in that you can take the, you know, the, the, uh, the content out of the, the site and be able to display that in the template system. But using any template system, forcing any template system inside the CMS is going to, you know, make that a harder issue. Then there's two sides to that, though, because then what happens with those people that don't want to do that and they just want to run a Drupal site? then they don't have they don't have a theme layer that's not going to that doesn't work for people either so i think that you know when you're when you're working on a project such as drupal where you're catering to such a large audience you have to you have to knowingly make some decisions that you're like right this is this is the best thing that we've got right now so let's go with that and uh, you know maybe that's not going to be the best decision later but you know you can say that about anything you know hindsight's 2020 so um, i do think that uh, the, what we have chosen to go in there makes a lot of sense. I think that, like I said earlier, the idea that now we have the, the library's YAML file for pulling in all of your JavaScript libraries or however you want to manage that is a lot more maintainable than it was before. So um, those types of things, I think, are steps in the right direction. What's the state of external libraries in Drupal 8? In Drupal 8? Is Teo in the room? Hey, Teo Beato. No, he's not. I couldn't tell you as of the last two weeks. <laughs> I don't know if that's changed or not. Um, but uh, Teo Beatola is, uh, is the core maintainer of JavaScript. He's giving a core conversation of JavaScript in Drupal 8 core later this week. Um, that would be that a great question to ask him. Yeah. Or not. He also goes. He goes by not, as well. Anybody else? Yes, Millers. Was your hand up over on the side somewhere? No. Okay. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Would it be a good idea to put SAS into Drupal core? Yeah. Would, who, who said no? Who said no? Okay. So Morton says no. Okay. Yeah. I would. I would. I would go with no as well. on that one. <laughs> um, same. Same idea though, right? So, you know, that that doesn't compile on the server side and things along those lines. So in the front end, why, yeah, I don't think that you can force those types of of, of ideas onto a, a platform that runs that way. I don't know. I, I think that that would be a step in the wrong direction. In the same way, I think that you know, forcing um, jQuery to run. It would be the wrong step as well. So, hey, Mike. Yeah, like I don't we've, think we've seen with the jQuery update, and it's a huge. That's pain. true. Jake, you're yeah, right. 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 That's true. Yeah. yeah. Or the ham. Yeah, yeah the ham mount. Yeah. Right. So John said that. There's multiple ways to compile SAS. You can compile it verbose, debugging. You can the, the way that that no SAS, no SAS yeah. right? SAS lib. Yep. Or then, what libraries are you running? Do you have to run Compass? You know, or are you going to force those types of things? Or are you going to run Scotch? I mean, there's there's a lot of different routes that you could have for managing your mix in libraries as well. So, mm -hmm. if you're going to go down the SAS route, then what else would you add? Because that's not always enough anyway. So, none is probably better than one in that case. Any more questions? Oh, sorry. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Cool. Great. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.